but I will be reading from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no gods before me. Well, I'm excited to be back with you today. It's a good day and a good year to be able to worship God and just be able to enjoy the singing and enjoy the prayers and enjoy our time together. Uh, it's been an eventful week. <laughs> I don't know if yours has been eventful, but mine has been eventful. Uh, you can read the bulletin and find out a little bit more about it. I'm not telling everybody, so it's just one of those things. Not now, later. So anyway, uh, new classes started today. So hopefully you got to go to one of those. If you're interested in teaching, we have a teaching class. Please be able to come to that. Uh, we're all just going to talk about teaching and about how's the best way to go about doing that. Uh, so we'd love to have you in that as well as any of the other classes. They're, they're always going to be good. New ones on Wednesday as well. We want to talk a little bit about what are some of the core things that we have that really don't change that allow us to make changes. It's really hard when everything is changing, don't you think? When the whole world around you seems to change, you ever notice when they put in one-way street, you still want to go that way? You're going to the grocery store, but your car says work, and so it just kind of goes that direction. Uh, it happens to us all the time, and, and you know, if we no longer work at a place or no longer live at a place, we still find ourselves that's the way we go. That's the direction that we had. And so it's one of those things that is difficult for us to, to do. And so change sometimes is one of the hardest things, but I think it's much, much easier if we know exactly what's not going to change. So in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about some things that are not going to change. And specifically, we'll be looking at some of the Ten Commandments and some of the things that that mentions, it gives us a better platform to realize some of the things that are changing and that we need to accept as change. And so the one thing that we realize is God never changes. That's a great thing, isn't it, to know that God never changes? I think sometimes we don't know that. We uh, need some kind of security first. We get a misconception of our world that thinks in our world, there should be things that are fair, right? Don't you think it should be fair? It should be just. There ought to be a place where it balances out. After all, everything comes back to even, doesn't it? Anytime you pour out water, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be level. It's going to go back to even. So everything else, all the other events, should go back to even. That's false. We do not live in a just world. We do not live in a world that is going to be fair, that is going to be balanced. It, we just don't. So I want you to think about that. We think there's two competing forces at least, maybe good and evil. We don't know which is going to win, but since you're in church this morning, we're voting for one. We believe, you know, good's going to win. Evil's another force in the world, but evil actually has no power. It distorts what's good, and that's the best it can do. And so it isn't the fact that there's, we're in a competing world and that there's good and there's evil and, you know, one might win over the other. Which one is God? God is good, and so therefore, we understand that good is going to win. And that's why we're here this morning, is because good is going to win. We think that there are things like fate, things like karma, things like luck. Have you ever been lucky? Okay. A couple of people recognize, man, what happened to the rest of you guys? We've only got about three or four people in here who have been lucky, so the rest of you guys either don't recognize luck or you think you've never been lucky. Don't follow that one then. 
But we still believe that. There's a chance. It'll get better. We're going to do it exactly the same way over and over and over again. But next time it's going to work, right? Next time it'll get better. Next time we'll be able to... No. There are not opposing forces in this world. There's only one force in this world. And that's God. Luck is not a force. Fair is not a force. It only has its existence in that it relates to God. And when you start thinking about some of those things, we think about that, you know, it will get lucky and will things will be better. Or if we work hard enough, we'll call it fate that, you know, these things come to those who work hard enough and try hard enough. Uh, if you do good, it'll come back to you. That one we call karma, right? What goes around comes around. That's the, the karma. And we, we believe those. We buy into those. And those really are not the way our world works. You saw the number of hands of people who think they're lucky. I mean, if you really are, wouldn't you jump up and say, boy, I am the luckiest person alive. Luck works for me 98% of the time. Right? No, luck works maybe 1%. Well, that's not a very good odds. That's not even fair. Our world has only one power in it. And that one power is God. That's the only power. We call him good. His goodness powers our world. He has no competition at all whatsoever. There isn't anything else that relates to him or says that can threaten him. Evil simply the distortion of what's good, it does not create. But if you don't have God, then it can be pretty dark. Then it can be pretty horrible. And then it can do all kinds of things that makes us uncomfortable. Evil's this distortion of what's good. It's the excess, it's the indulgence, it's the thing that makes it not worth living for, and it takes what could have been good that God created and twists it into a way that it's not. Well, I want to share some of that with you today because I think that's where we are, and the first thing in coming to a relationship with God is to recognize He is big enough where there is absolutely no competition with Him whatsoever at all. And if he's not, you need a bigger God. If he can be in competition with luck, if he can be in competition with chance, if God has to worry about karma, really? He made everything. He can do anything. He can change anything. He has no competition at all in this earth. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to do what he says because we choose, and he has allowed that. It's not because we are strong enough to stand against him. It's that he has allowed that. I want to go back and look at some of the things that we need to know about. Israel was coming out of Egypt. They were led by Moses, and I want to look at the passage that we have read, was read by Samuel. God appears on top of a mountain. He comes down and fire and smoke and it's one of those amazing times in the presence of God and he speaks from the top of the mountain and he gives the Ten Commandments to all of the people who are there and their response to God speaking directly to them is we can't stand it anymore please don't tell us Moses you go up and tell us what he says really? But every single one of them heard it. Every single one of them heard exactly what God said. And they said, we don't want to hear what he says. God gives his credentials. I am the Lord your God. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who brought you out of slavery. It had never been done before. I am the one who gave all of those plagues. I am the one who over overcome one of the most powerful nations in the world at that time. I am the one who split the Red Sea and has brought you to this mountain to be able to meet with God, the only force in this world. 
Egypt thought they were strong. They thought they had a great mighty nation and they were no competition at all for God. And so the first thing he says in building a relationship with God is there's only one God. There's only one force in the world. Don't have any other gods before me. There is only one God. Don't worship anything else. Nothing else is as important as God. And that's just the way he says it. Well, is he serious? I mean, does he really mean that? I mean, we've seen Ten Commandments around for a long time, right? They've been here for thousands of years. They were before Christ. They're, they're a long time ago. Well, it's like asking your wife if you can have other girlfriends. When she says no, is she serious? <laughs> Which will explain the scar. <laughs> no, actually not. It was either the hike, the bear, or the wife. You know, one of those, take your pick. So, yeah, she's serious. She means that. You are not going to have anybody else but me. You made a promise. You are not going to have anyone else but me. And if I find out about it, you won't even have you. <laughs> she is serious about that as much God is more serious about it. I am the only God. You will have no other gods before me because there's no competition for one. Is there anything else that does well? Does karma work for you? Does luck work for you? Does, well, chance will make it better sometime? You know, everybody ends up in a good place, right? No, they don't all end up in a good place. Not without going to who's good first. And that's the only way we end up in a good place. As you look at the reason he's saying this, this might be because of the gods of Egypt. They had a tremendous number of gods in Egypt. And they considered them to be very powerful gods in Egypt. And so you can see the one that looks like an Egyptian god that they actually took off of Egyptian tablets. That's Ra. And maybe the depiction now of, and we invent this all the time, right? We invent all kinds of gods, gods of war. Just if you ever play any video games, there's all kinds of superheroes and superpowers. And even if you just watch TV, there's all kinds of gods that we invent. And if you ever get serious about them, you've replaced God. It isn't a force of luck or a god or the sun or Ra. There's one God and he does not change. Some things need to change. Seasons change. We recognize that. There's spring, summer, fall, winter. Or in Arizona, there's spring, summer, summer, summer and then two weeks of fall and winter. But it, those things are going to change. We always grow. You cannot stop things from growing. When you're younger, that was great. Now that we're older, not so much. You still can't stop things from growing. It takes concerted effort to do that. But God does not change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And we can put an anchor on God that he is always going to be there. As they go through and just before they go into the promised land, Moses restates some of the things that God has told them. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want you to listen to what he says there. This is a familiar passage because it talks about family, but it also talks about God. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And all these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them. And when you sit in your house 
and when you walk on the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on your doorposts of your house and your gates. Wow. That becomes very, very important because it's essentially taking up all of your life. He says, here's the one thing I want you to teach. There is one God, and I want you to love him. That's essentially what the passage says. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And from that, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what he says. That's the first way to gain a relationship with that God. Keep all of his commandments. It's how to love God. We have that as the source. Teach your children that. When you walk, when you travel, when you go, when you sit in your house, write it on the doorpost, the cornerstone, whatever's the prominent place in your house, put it down. It says, this is what's real. I want you to love God. I want you to realize there's one God and there are no others. This is Jesus' first most important command. He pulls it straight out of this passage. So Jesus and God and the Ten Commandments, everybody says this is number one. Recognize there is no com competition. I saw in a book one time something where the guy said, well, can anything bother God? Can somebody do something to God? He says, well, Mike could do something to him. Mike could upset him, you know, do something. And he says, well, make God bigger. Make him as big as the world. Could anything hurt God? Well, that's pretty big. Would he feel anything if he was that big? I mean, would he, would he feel anything at all if he pounded on his toe? I probably wouldn't feel anything. Well, maybe he's still too small. Make him as big as the universe. Make him bigger than the universe. Make him able to create all the galaxies that we have. And you're beginning to approach, is anything in our imagination that big that it could threaten God, that it could go against God? We just think about God as if he's too small sometimes. There is one God, and he's the one that's most important. We see this happening all the time. We see it happening in history. We see it happen with Israel as they were about to go into promised land. They did not choose God. They were traveling. They were going to a promised land, but they didn't trust God with their future. They didn't believe in the victory. They didn't believe about promised land. They saw giants in the promised land, and they said, we don't think that we can do this because those would threaten the almighty God who created heaven and earth. Really? You don't think your God could handle that? You don't think that? Yeah, we should go back to slavery. Was that an option? That they could go back to slavery? But somehow in their mind they thought, well, that's an option. Why should we go forward? Why should we go where God wants us to go? We'll go back to slavery. And what would happen if you went back to slavery? they just kill you. I, I mean, after all, you're disobedient slaves. What happens? But somehow in their head, they got the idea that, well, that's an option. Because we can go back to our past. I want to go back to the way it was. I want to go back to times before because that's an option. Let me tell you today, that is not an option. You cannot go back to a happier time in your life. You cannot go back to last year. You cannot go back to the way things were when things were good. You cannot go back to times of glory when you were the best. But you can choose God and you can see what he makes of you now. And so many times I see people, this is the biggest God I think that we face, is the past. Because we want to go back there. We think we could. If I moved back to my hometown, it would be like it was when I lived there. 
If I went back around my friends, it would be like it was when I lived there. It will not. And as soon as you get back there, you realize it, it is not the same. It can't be. Just the fact that Tim went to college, he comes back and it looks different, doesn't it? I don't know what happened to mom and dad, but you've been gone three months, four months, and it looks different somehow. Somehow it's different, right, Elijah? Oh, your parents are good. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow just that little break after a year, you got back and you wonder what happened to my parents? I thought they were good before. No, you guys' parents are good. But even just that little bit, you cannot go back to your past. There are no other gods. There is no fate. There is no luck. There is no past. You have one choice. Recognize there is a God. Now, we invent gods all the time. The Egyptians invented gods. These guys in Israel invented the fact that we could go back. We don't want to go forward. We could go back. And as long as they believed that was an option, they did not have God. Because that's what takes away God. And God did not let any of them see his promised land. He did let their children in. Because their children believed they could go forward. And as they go in, they conquer the land. It's not easy. It's not perfect. But they do and they go and they conquer and they finally have their place. And we recognize there are decisions that they make. And so after going into the promised land, Joshua asked them to choose who they're going to follow. In the end of Joshua, all the battles have been won. They already have their land. Now we're where we're going to be. And the problem is the day-to-day. As long as you're still trying to fight and still trying to win and still trying to get to the victory, boy, we're doing well with that. But then when it's it's done, we're solved, we're settled, and uh, now it's just the day-to-day. How do we handle that? You make sure you know who's God. That's what you do. You make sure you know who's God. As Joshua talks to the people, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He says, I want you to make a decision. I want you to decide who are you going to serve. It's not just a matter of, well, you know, I could get lucky. There's a chance, right? And as long as we believe there's a chance, we will not have God. God says, I'm not having any competition. That's just your imagination thinking things will get better. Things get better when you follow God. That's when things get better. He is the one in charge. He is the one over this whole earth. He is the one who wants you to decide to follow him because he will not force you. Joshua didn't say to choose next year whom you will serve. He spoke of this day. While we are still in daylight and before darkness comes, and before darkness becomes more and more normal. And the longer you put it off and the more you think about it, the more we think it's a choice as if there was a choice. Jesus says exactly the same thing in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Just as an example, you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one master because you can't, fully dedicate yourself to two you can dedicate yourself to one and that's it same situation with the wife you understand that right 
You can't do two. There's only going to be one because somebody's going to be mad and you're going to get blamed for it. What you do for one will seem like hate to the other. We think we can do it. We think we could love people like that. We think uh, you can't. He says you can't serve God and money. Money is a big one that you see. That's one of the biggest things we think is a power in this earth. It's not. Because some people think that God gave them money for them instead of giving them money for them to use for God. And really it's more for them to use for God. The biggest example, and maybe the best example of this, is the rich young ruler. Let me just share this passage with you in Matthew 19. Jesus has this encounter. It says, Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, What good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. He's still on the same theme. There is only one. As if he's asking Jesus, Well, what do you say? You're a God. No, he says, There's only one who is good. Why are you asking me about that? If you would enter life, Keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Why? Because he thought he could do both. I can serve God, and I can have my own security. And if God doesn't work out, at least I've got my money, and I can take care of myself. You ever done that? That's what we always do with college careers, right? You start one, but, you know, make sure you've got something to fall back on. They especially say that to preachers for some reason. (laughs) Not sure why. But they especially say that because you never know. We're going to change careers. We're going to change things. And it may not work out like you think. Jesus' answer is, well, do what's commanded. Uh, I mean, you've got a simple explanation. Here's what you need to do to get eternal life. Here's what you need to do to develop this relationship with God. He's laid it out in commands, and we'll try and understand some of those, but you know that's just a simple thing of here's what you do. And he says, well, which ones? As if maybe I'm counting. Then he says, well, I've already done all those. Anything else? He says, all right, let me tell you about the anything else. You love only one God. You have only one thing in your life. Nothing else comes close. And so why don't you get rid of the money and let God be the one who sustains you. Let God be the one who lifts you up. Let God be the one who gives you grace. Not that you could buy your way out of the situation. And he thought he was so faithful. And Jesus lets him walk away. At the end of this story, I've always wanted to say to Jesus, go after him. Tell him, yeah, it's okay. We'll let you keep the money. It was just a test. But you're going to have to work on this because we're not going to give it to the poor. We're going to put it in a bank and let's see if you can live without it. That wasn't the option. Because then I could go back to the past to my security, to my place where I did not live as if there's only one God in this world and only one power. And if it doesn't work, nothing works. Not chance, not luck, not karma. Nothing else works but that one God. And therefore, I will love him with all my heart, soul, and might because it would seem like hate to do anything else. 
And when we put God first, all other things fall into perspective. Maybe it's sports that's most important that you would give up God for. Maybe it's friends because they can be really powerful. Or maybe it's family, just, well, they don't want me going there. And we would give up things of God. The prodigal thought it was the fun of the party. He got his money, took off, let me go live how I want to live, God. I'm not going to recognize you at the power in the world. I'm going to recognize the God of fun. I'm going to recognize I can make myself happy. I can, and he finds that he can't. Because it runs out. And when things run out, there's only one force in this world that gets you through the hard times, through the trials, through the tragedy. And that's God. So let me just say today, can you decide to build your relationship with God? Can you make that most important? Is there anything that's standing in your way? Are you hoping your life will work out better without him? Do you think that really? It's going to be better if I don't because at least I have more options. I have more fun and more money because I'm not going to give anything to the church. I'm going to be able to go party. I'm going to be able to have more friends. It's You're fooling yourself. And you're going to end up wishing for the good old days that weren't really all that good. You see, the one thing that makes all the difference and why you would never threaten a wife with another girlfriend is she's worth it. She's given everything. That's what it's all about. That's where love begins when you get to that kind of level. And God says, and I'm going to love you. I want you to love me. And when you have that kind of commitment and that kind of dedication to each other, the one God of this world cannot be threatened by any other thing. It's going to bless your life in ways you can't imagine. Today, if there's anything standing in your way, you need that. That is step one. That is the first thing for this year. There is one God. Make him yours. If we can help, would you come while we stand and sing?